Thank you very much for being here and welcome to Sister Speak, addressing HIV AIDS in the black community. My name is Marjorie Innocent. For those of you who I have not had a chance to meet yet, very, very pleased to see you all here. I'm the Senior Director of Research and Programs at the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation. As many of you likely know, the foundation started to play a, an increasing role in helping to elevate the impact and the understanding of HIV AIDS in the African American community a couple of years ago through a very important partnership that is funded by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. It's called ALLY, Act Against AIDS Leadership Initiative. And there are to date 16 black national organizations that are part of this partnership. And over this time, the organizations have really come to work together to help to elevate the issue of HIV AIDS, elevate awareness, and also education and prevention within the black community. A number of these organizations had already been participating in such efforts, but some of them had not. And working collaboratively has really helped us to understand how important the issue is, how it needs to be incorporated much more in the work that we do on a regular basis around health and social issues. And so it's really, really played a tremendous role, not just in the work that we do, but also on for us as a personal education tool. So we're really, really grateful to be a part of this, um, of this effort, of this growing effort. In addition to that, I just wanted to mention that we also have a fellow, Dr. LaShawn McKeever, who is sitting in the corner there right now, uh, who is a fellow whose work is focusing on HIV AIDS within our Center for Policy Analysis and Research. And the work that she has been doing will be coming out in a report that will also include policy recommendations within the next couple of months. So please look out for that on our website, www.cbcfinc.org. For this initiative uh, for today, we also have partnered with the Red Pump Project to help to bring the power of social media to the issue of HIV AIDS. Um, follow, you can follow along uh, using hash CBCFHIV. The Red Pump Project is a national nonprofit initiative working on the ground and online to ensure that women are empowered with knowledge about HIV and AIDS and the issues that surround it. The mission of the project is to promote HIV prevention through education, encouraging safe, safe safe sex practices, and open dialogue about the issues that surround sexual and reproductive health. The organization uses a red shoe as its symbol, uh, both a symbol of power and a symbol of womanhood. So we're really, really thankful to them for also collaborating with us to make this happen today. They're really, really dynamic young women. And uh, last but not least, I know she's not going to be happy with me, but that's okay. That's what happens when you're a boss. You can do that. Um, I really do want to thank and really raise up Lisa Fager Bediaco, who <laughs> who really single-handedly has enabled the foundation to play the role that it's playing right now around HIV and AIDS. My background's in public health, so I was I've been aware of the issue for a while, and was not as I would say forceful as Lisa and um, determined as Lisa, in part because of all the hats that I wear, but also because, you know, Lisa's got a style on her, of her own, and she's got, you know, that media background. She uses it in so many different ways that are, you know, really astounding to really help to bring the foundation on board with this work. And when she started to think about this session, she really wanted to bring together a group of individuals to talk about what can be done to help women to understand the impact of the disease on their lives, but also their families and their communities, and to help them to play a more leading role in efforts to address the disease. And so, with no further ado, I would like to introduce to you, as I call her, the mastermind behind this session, and also the life force behind the work that we do around HIV AIDS, Lisa Fager Bediato. Thanks, Marjorie. Um, thank you for coming today. I know there is a lot happening today at 9 o'clock. 
and uh, I'm really happy that you chose this session to attend. And I just wanted to let you know that the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation has been really active in HIV. Um, our first year, we did a set of town hall meetings across the country in CBC member districts, including uh, Columbia, South Carolina, Washington, D.C., and uh, Jamaica, Queens, New York. And we really listen to the people who are on the ground, and that's where I really get my inspiration and motivation is listening to what people are doing, what people want to do, what people need, and just trying to give it a uh, um, bigger exposure and get the right people in the room and policymakers listening. So hopefully we really are making a difference. And so uh, this year I really wanted to focus a lot on women. Uh, you know, I didn't know until I um, started HIV the criteria that the CDC uses for priority populations and uh, they focus on transmission and not acquisition, and that's how women uh, usually obtain uh, HIV. And so I felt like there really needed to be more of an emphasis on black women because we are the, you know, really second largest impacted population. Uh, and so this year, in addition to what we're doing right now, we also did a briefing on the Hill called um, Advancing Ep Ep uh, Economic Opportunities for uh, Black Women Living with HIV AIDS. And we had a great turnout. We had honest conversation. Uh, we talked about what we could do, what's happening, uh, solutions, not just, you know, talking about uh, the current state, but what we're going to do about it. And a lot of different partnerships happened. Um, just this year, I've already partnered with 20 um, national and local organizations across the country in making sure that they uh, get their information out there to uh, audiences that need to hear it. And so I'm really happy that we did that. And I also uh, was able to, um, and we partnered with the National Association of People Living with AIDS to do the congressional briefing. And I also took uh, uh, the senior vice president there, Vanessa Johnson, to the Black Women's Roundtable. And I'm not sure if you all know about that, but the Black Women's Roundtable is an organization that reaches five million people. And they're women who um, oversee uh, black national organizations, either focusing on women or just um, the black community in general, including Dr. Scott, who is the president of the CBCF. And um, I was able to take uh, women there to talk about HIV and really, you know, have an honest discussion because, you know, what I found out is people uh, are still not aware of what's going on and how uh, we're at, a, uh, at an epidemic crisis right now with HIV. And because you don't hear, hear about it, people just assume that, oh, we must be getting better. But that is not, that's not the truth. And so today, with no... Um, further waiting. I want to introduce Linda and my expectations uh, for this panel is just to really start in with the conversation. You have the bios of all the speakers in your um, in the journal that you were handed and um, you know we'll have like Linda will tell you who they are but we really want to start getting into uh, a conversation and really talk about what, what we're going to do, how to mobilize African American women. Okay, and this is, uh, I'm so excited that I was able to get Linda Villarosa to moderate this panel because I really wanted a journalist. Uh, not someone just, you know, kind of a celebrity talking head, but somebody who's really involved in the issue. And Linda wrote the first piece on HIV AIDS for Essence Magazine in the Excellent. 80s. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Okay, Excellent. so I mean, we're going way back and she's been with this issue ever since. And she's also written, uh, the article that appeared in the New York Times that focused on black women and HIV. And so she knows this issue. So we're really going to get into some discussion here. So I'm excited. So Linda Villarosa. Thank you so much. Um, I'm very excited to be here. Thank you, Lisa. Lisa worked really hard to pull everything together. She kept everything buttoned up, kept everything tight, and um, organize this wonderful panel that I'm glad to be a part of. Um, so big thanks to CBCF. Um, this morning, uh, we're here to discuss black women and HIV, a subject that's very close to my own heart, as um, you heard. And um, we know that among women, African American women are the most affected. And it was interesting. I didn't make it to the conference last week in Orlando, but Kath Kathleen Sebelius, our um, uh, Secretary of Health, said, if you're a heterosexual white woman, well, she said, like me, <laughs> your risk of contracting HIV is low, one in 50,000. 
But as black women, that is not our experience. HIV for us is um, much, you know, the risk is much, much higher. In fact, we're 19, to our um, infection rate, our diagnosis rate is 19 times higher. Um, so the, the experience, the risk, and the fear of HIV is much, much different. Um, along with being infected and living with HIV more often, we are also the ones who are affected. We are the caretakers, we're the family members, we're the mothers, the daughters, the lovers of people living with HIV. We're also the healthcare providers, the social workers, the people really on the ground doing the work. And so I'm really, you know, proud to be part of that and, um, you know, excited to introduce the panel. Um, the ground rules for today are, I'm going to introduce everyone very briefly and then ask one question. And so then, you know, after that, I hope that the line between, um, you know, the people up here and the people in the audience goes away because I know that many of you out there are just as knowledgeable as those of us here. And so I hope that we can have a real discussion and, you know, in here we're family. Um, well, at least in my family, we talk a lot, we, you know, <laughs> we engage each other a lot and, you know, we get passionate. And so I hope that that discussion, you know, the discussion here today is like that. Um, this is C. Virginia Fields. Um, she is the CEO and president of the National Black Leadership Commission on AIDS. Um, she was, is the former borough president of Manhattan. Um, I, uh, her office is located in Harlem. I am a college professor in Harlem, and we have events at the college. And the last event we had, um, someone was coming through the door, and by all the commotion, I thought, oh, I didn't know Beyonce was going to be here. But <laughs> you should be ashamed of herself. <laughs> That's who it was. <laughs> so. <laughs> um, Janet Cleveland, I've known you for a very, for, uh, I don't know how many years, <laughs> but um, uh, at the CDC, where you have been for a very long time, much appreciated, and um, back in the bad old days before our current president, when it was very hard to reach anybody at the CDC, I knew I could always reach you to get comments, to get quotes, to get real information, so thank you. Um, Carolyn Massey, you and I are meeting for the first time. Um, uh, Carolyn works with women who are HIV positive. She also is very active in her own AIDS ministry at her church here in, D here in DC, right? Yes, New Samaritan. Yes. And um, her first book is being published. She's uh, authored next year. Um, Dr. Bambi Gaddis um, works on the ground in South Carolina. Her organization is the South Carolina HIV AIDS Council. She spent 20 years, 30 years. I missed 10 more, 10 years, because you look so good. <laughs> Showing, right? <laughs> Looking good. Um, 30 years working mm. on the ground, working with people, working, you know, being an agitator in the South where the problem is growing and um, drastic. And um, finally, this is Dr. Veronica Jenkins who is a um, MD, medical provider, working in HIV for 20 years, caring for patients um, here in DC, and also in, um, an HIV AIDS researcher. So thank you. Thank you first for your work. It, we're um, very appreciative for all that you do. I'm gonna start with you. Um, I'd like, I've heard you speak about, you know, it's a new time. We have an HIV strategy, we have a policy. Um, I guess we have till mid-December to um, have everybody get together and talk about what's, what's going to happen. So today, I'd like you to sort of comment on that strategy. What, what is missing? I mean, everyone kind of has the basics about the strategy, but tell me, and I've heard you say this before, what's missing for black women in that strategy, or what are Everything. the challenges? Okay. Everything. <laughs> I think women is only perhaps mentioned one or two times in terms of the word. A couple of things. First of all, to add to your statement that you said that Secretary of HHS said about women. Actually, when uh, doing the uh, Democratic uh, presidential campaign, President candidate Hillary Clinton said the same thing in, in words were very specific right here at Howard University. That if HIV AIDS uh, was the same as in terms of rates among white women, as it is among black women, there will be a national outrage. And we need to create that same kind of outrage because it is the case with black women. 
We are not uh, being heard on the issues. We do not have enough discussions about it. But with respect to the strategy, some of the issues of concern is that it does not address women specifically in terms of what we must do in those three areas to lower the incidence, to uh, increase access, and to address HIV-related disparities. With women, we must be inclusive of all of those issues as you spoke about poverty, illiteracy, domestic violence, because we know that they directly impact women being infected, staying infected, and not getting the kind of treatment and, that they need. Another very specific thing that we've seen is that, well, um, and that was a discussion among a group of really uh, involved and committed women back in October of last year when the National Black Leadership Commission of AIDS called 50 women together from across the country representing a broad spectrum in terms of experiences and backgrounds. And it was talked about in terms of just surveillance, how data is collected on as it relates to black women. We do not have a focus on black women that collects data to better inform decisions around services, access, and just what we need to do. So if we are not looking at women through uh, CDC, and I don't mean to look at Janet when I say <laughs> CDC, because I know CDC, Janet is not <laughs> doing that, but it's okay. So we need to look at our, how we collect the data. And lastly, I would say about that, you know, I was in a cab last night here in D.C. You know how it is when you're in D.C. When you get in a cab, you don't know other people, but if they're going in the same direction, they kind of jump in and you go together. I ended up in a cab with a couple of women from Houston, Texas. I don't know them. Uh, they said they would be here this morning and they might come. And they were asking me, what do I do? And we were talking about HIV and AIDS. And they said, one of the reasons, and these are people who work on the, on the ground too, that the message is not getting through is because there's no consistency to message. You got to have consistency in terms that she didn't say anything I didn't know, but I was glad to hear her say it. To have an impact, we need messages that focus specifically on women over a period of time, in, reach in those areas where we know that uh, they're, you know, potential great, at, at great risk, and we're not doing that. So we need our messaging, we need our surveillance systems in place, we need to recognize the impact of all of these social factors on the lives of black women and keep it in the conversation and have women at the table making policy. Good. Can you, um, you don't, I know you're not the CDC, <laughs> but you're our CDC right here. So can you respond to that? Talk about, you know, in terms of the policy. In terms of policy? And in well, terms of the work you do. Okay. Um, I serve as the Deputy Director for Prevention Programs within our Division of HIV and AIDS Prevention at CDC. And so uh, from a programmatic perspective, you know, we try to attempt to design prevention interventions that are appropriate for women that are culturally appropriate, that are responsive to what their needs are. But I think that part of the issue around policy when it comes to HIV and particularly women is that women's voices have not often been at the table. I totally agree with uh, C. Virginia. Um, even at CDC, there have been very few women, let alone women of color, and certainly African American women, that have sat at the table in terms of leadership positions. I am one of very few and have been for many years. And so in terms of what is happening with the national AIDS strategy, I think that from a, a policy perspective, women's voices have got to be heard. And that advocacy has to happen and has to come from women. Because no one can tell one story like that, on, that, 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 that person. And so you can't depend and we can't depend on others to be able to tell a story for us because they haven't experienced what our journeys have been. And so the voices need to be there, uh, voices need to be heard on the Hill, uh, voices need to be uh, heard within your uh, local communities, your uh, congressionals, people who are stakeholders within the community, they have to hear what the concerns of black women uh, actually are. Because the persons who are telling the stories probably don't represent 
again, black women and, and what black women's experiences have been. So I think we have to continue to educate, we have to continue to motivate, we have to continue to have authentic conversations. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's another issue. We often have very inauthentic conversations within our communities, but we have to be real about what is happening. I think that we can't um, um, uh, talk about what is happening in terms of women without talking about men. And oftentimes I feel like that's the conversation that's missing in terms of uh, issues around HIV prevention for women. So our voices have to be heard. We have to tell our story. Good. Um, I'm gonna <coughs> skip you and come back to you, Carolyn. Okay. Bambi, um, can you talk about the situation in the South? Um, I noticed that that, you know, like we were saying, if women are um, shut out, women in the South are really shut out. So could you sort of paint that picture for us? Many of us from, are here in this room are from the North or from, you know, big cities. So I'm particularly interested in what's happening in the South in smaller communities. <clears throat> well, I'm not sure if women in the South are any more phased out than others. Mm -hmm. uh, what comes to mind, you know, um, I have no other choice but to look historically at um, the environment in which I now live in. I'm a recovering northerner. <laughs> so uh, um, I've, uh, I've lived in the South uh, and lived in, uh, uh, there long enough that when I, I, I think about the history of health, period, in, in southern states, where I live in a state which was a venue for slavery, and we look at other kinds of illnesses that generated during the early days of neglect, from yellow fever and how uh, diseases were prevalent. When I think about the history of, of my state where physicians um, engaged in medical discoveries by engaging a population of people um, to experiment. And so with that, there's this issue of control and lack thereof. And despite all of our economic gains, there is an under core mm -hmm. of, you know, and remember I live in the state where they took the Confederate flag off the top of the dome and now it's in the front yard. And so there's an ever present issue on one side of what one person perceives as heritage and what another group of people see as heritage. How it manifests in my world is that basically women in general, regardless of class, are disempowered. Uh, when we are at the state house, there are not women of, of means there advocating for women. Um, I think it has become more of an issue of classism, mm. even within and among our population. And so it's playing out uh, socioeconomically uh, with Southern, in the Southern environment, it's, coming, it's uh, being played out where even those of us that think we've arrived do not have the knowledge, do not have the concern, don't have the empathy for this issue, and really have attempted to disconnect ourselves uh, from the conversation. And so from a personal level, um, we are not holding our physicians accountable where we can get an open dialogue. And much of this we have yet to come to the basis of why um, we have not taken possession of our bodies mm -hmm. and subsequently have not taken possession of our rights in the South. Okay. Um, you know, I live in the state of you lie. And so how, you, how that plays out um, is relative, but knowledge, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll close by kind of saying this, you know, I had a professor who, uh, a white professor who I respected greatly. And he and I got into a philosophical conversation and he shared with me um, something that I've never forgotten. And he said that if you want to control a group of people, if you want to control their destiny, there's two things you seek to control. The first is their access to education, whether they get it, who renders it, and in the South, it is, it is a mainstay that there is a neglect of making sure that people have access to knowledge, mm -hmm. that only the few get it. Um, he also said that if you want to control their destiny, you control their access to health care. If they get health care, who renders it, the quality of it, and how it's rendered. And so in the South and in this country, um, it is known um, that we are... Uh, we, we stand between those few of us that are innovators 
uh, those that are early adopters, but a greater bulk of those who are laggards, people who have not been given access and subsequently can't take control mm -hmm. of, of their, their own destiny. Mm -hmm. And so it's playing it itself out in full effect. Good. Dr. Jenkins, can you um, speak from a perspective of care? You are a healthcare provider, you are a doctor on the panel. Can you talk about um, sort of the challenges of providing health care for especially African American women here in DC? Well, first I'd like to say that whenever someone says we've got to hold our physicians accountable, <laughs> I always want to jump right in and say we are accountable. Um, we are accountable to the people that we see on a day-to-day -day basis. It is our job, our responsibility, it is a part of our oath to make sure that they are well cared for and indeed that they have a good quality of life. Who I would say we need to hold accountable are the people who hold the purse strings to make sure that the folks who come to us on a day-to-day -day basis are able to get the kind of care that they need. I will say that one of the things that's most that stands out most for me here in, as a provider here in the district is that we've taken not only the idea that the HIV rate here in the district is probably one of the highest in the nation, but we've taken some time to really look at that and decide what to do. Our test and treat initiative is going to be, I think, a model for other cities to take. In other words, get out there and test and treat and educate everyone about this disease in hopes that we can get them into the proper care that they need. As a result of that, we've seen an enormous number of people come into care who may have not previously come because of the test and treat initiative. As a result of that, what we're finding is that HIV, as, as has been said, is a comprehensive disease. It's not something we need to treat in isolation. Yes, we need to treat their HIV by first having the medications available for patients to take. Secondly, we have to make sure that there are insurances in place to make sure that they can get the medicines. We have to make sure that there are uh, clinic resources available for them to be able to see a physician. I always say to patients, and I just inject this, um, if you are with a physician, with whom you cannot speak of your most intimate details, then you are with the wrong physician. And we have to make sure that our clients, that our patients understand that and move towards being with someone who can certainly make them better. I think here in the district, we've recognized that it is not just about women, but it is also about men. It is about families and it is about our young children. You already know the statistics. AIDS cases are definitely decreasing, but HIV infection continues to mount. There are some 60,000 people who are diagnosed with this disease all of the time, every day. That means we've got to put forth more resources, more efforts into providing comprehensive medical care. And my last statement in terms of this is, HIV has become a disease for most of us that we handle quite well, surprisingly enough. But what happens is these folks who are being handled, meaning their disease is being managed, also are living longer. Mm -hmm. And as a result, they are developing comorbid infections or other diseases that may impact on their lives. It makes no sense for me to be able to give the three prescriptions a young woman needs in order to care for her HIV if I cannot give a prescription that she can afford to help with her hypertension or her diabetes. So we have to see this as an eye-opening, comprehensive disease that must be addressed in a more filling and more fulfilling way for each one of our clients and for their medical care. So you know the statistics, but we've got to look behind that and start treating people that means men, women, children, older adults, and our adolescents. You give the group any title that you want, but this disease crosses all of those classes. And we have to, unfortunately, address each and every one of them. I only give you one horror story. A young lady comes into the clinic and she says, I don't even understand how I could have gotten this disease because I've been celibate for 10 years. But I say to her, this disease started 
long before then with you. She had a T cell count of about seven. And for mm -hmm. those of you who may not understand, the normal T cell range is somewhere between 400, 1500. But hers was seven. She was not sick. So getting a diagnosis of AIDS didn't mean that she was automatically getting ready to kick the bucket. It simply means that she had progressed far into the disease. But back to the story, she says, I don't know how I got it. I think what this says to us is we have to get the right messages out there, mm -hmm. put them in the places where they need to be seen to get the patients to come in, but we also have to go to the higher powers, those who hold those strings to make it an efficient and affordable medical case for each of our patients to be treated. Thanks. Good. Thank you. Um, we mentioned on this panel that we want to hear voices and we want to hear, you know, real people's stories. So um, I, I invite you to share your story, Carolyn. Well, first of all, let me just say I am just humbled to be sitting among these ladies. Um, the Lord knew what he was doing when he um, gave me this diagnosis. I happen to have a very big mouth, so <laughs> I'll be one of those people who talks about it. I've been living um, HIV positive for over 16 years. <laughs> um, in 1994, I lost my only brother at age 35 um, to this disease. And um, we were living in central Jersey at the time. AZT is what they were giving Anthony. And it was making him sicker instead of better. And it was a very frightening experience. None of us knew anything really about AIDS. Um, if you mentioned the word AIDS, my mother would shudder. It was something that frightened her. She was ignorant about it, and we didn't know anything either. So when Anthony passed away, that was a loss. In November of the same year, I was diagnosed. So 94 was rough. And I contracted it through consensual heterosexual intercourse with a, a gentleman who knew that he was positive but did not choose to share it with me. Now, I had to go through some things spiritually to get past that, and today he is thoroughly forgiven, but that doesn't mean we don't learn from it. It takes two, and uh, I was one of the two. I consented to it. But today I know that consenting to sex is not something you just decide to do without some information. <laughs> and unfortunately, I've had to learn the hard way, and your word just ain't good enough. I gotta see some paper. <laughs> <laughs> couple of times. Yes. <laughs> yes. Like six and six months. Um, <clears throat> I laugh because, you know, I have to. I have to. I have a son who is 30, a young professional. He's not positive. I have a daughter who's about to start college. She's not positive. I'm blessed. I'm yes. here. And because I'm talking, somebody else is not going to become HIV positive. If it takes showing my face, that's okay. Uh, lots of venues that I speak in, lots of uh, responsibilities that I've taken on as a volunteer, different uh, things. Sometimes people are not happy about some of the things that I say because I do read the research. I do keep up with what you ladies are doing and you and the audience are doing because it's my life. And um, not only are we, as black women, 19 times more likely to be diagnosed, we are not diagnosed as often. And um, that's an issue. I think that we don't realize that HIV affects a lot of people, including white women. You know, most of our health care comes through public sources. Theirs comes through their private physician. 
I can tell you as a person who has lived around other people that are HIV and others that are not HIV, that all those cases don't get reported. <laughs> and it's a small world, Charlie Brown. Mm. People are having sex with each other without regard to what color they are. And uh, I happen to serve on a commission in a suburban area. Uh, that's not a safe place either. So, I mean, we need the experts. We need the scientists, we need the scholars, but we also need to, to speak up for ourselves mm -hmm. and face the facts. Stop running from what is obvious. You know, it's obvious <laughs> that in 2010, it is just not wise to have unprotected sex, period. It's not obvious. It's not obvious. And, you know, we're talking about getting to women, but getting to men as well. We have to look at the systems in which we matriculate. Mm -hmm. um, I work, it, I am just astonished at the number of people in leadership at historically black colleges mm -hmm. who are clueless mm -hmm. about this issue. They don't want to talk about it. We're doing testing on HBCUs. The rates of chlamydia, gonorrhea, HIV, HPV, HCV just continues to amaze us. A 15% chlamydia rate when compared to the health department for everybody tested is 1.4. That's a reason for concern. HIV is the least of our worries, quite frankly. It's all of the predat predatory and now you say that word specifically, uh, the other STIs that we don't talk about that are, that are the precursors and the beginnings of someone who's at risk for HIV. If they had trick, if they had chlamydia, if they had gonorrhea, then they are a candidate. The amount of young people at freshmen when we survey them that report that they're having unprotected sex with multiple sex partners is absolutely astounding and not from a judgmental perspective. It's that you have a, a, a group of frats and you're doing intervention and out of eight brothers, not one of them could put a condom on right. And so when we look at the skill sets that are required, you know, the attitudes and the beliefs is our first key we keep saying knowledge. Knowledge is power, but it doesn't predict behavior. And so what we women and what we men have to first look at is what do we believe personally about HIV in, in, a, in the depths of our soul, not what you perpetrate to your friends and to your sorority sisters and your federation of girls clubs and your eastern stars, not what you say to them, but at your core. Do you believe that women are going to be sexual people? Do you believe that we should take control of our bodies? Do you believe that you should talk to your daughter and your son about how to negotiate sex, whether you think they're having it or not? My 12-year-old grandson, he says the women love him. <laughs> you know, he's calling me in the department store asking me why his penis isn't bigger. And you know, and I'm looking at faces, but this is the reality, you know, and I, and I can say to him forthrightly, I got a book for you. I have a Bible in my house, but I got a resource for you so that we can talk about it. That's not happening in our families. So if we're not talking about it in our homes, at the dinner table, and if we're not at the dinner table, then where are we discussing these issues? So if a parent doesn't have it, how in God's name can you give it to your child? It's just totally impossible. We have not integrated it into our homes. And until we do that, we won't get to women, our sons, or anybody else. And I would agree with uh, <clears throat> Bambi's statement in terms of not being obvious. And, but, uh, and I'm glad you mentioned that, Carolyn, because I think a lot of the responses in terms of information, literature, or programs that get funded uh, it's being done on the assumption that it's obvious, that everybody knows about it, that there's enough information out there. As I speak around the country to women and men about HIV and start talking about some of the statistics, you know, and I measure it, whether I'm in an audience where I think people have the information, and sometimes I just say, let me go at it this way and give them the information. The faces, the, the, the reactions, 
It's amazing. And these are, again, women and men we think should know this stuff. That's why I was glad that at least when CDC began to reach out to some of these non-traditional organ national organizations like the 100 Black <coughs> Women, and they have really stepped up, and I'm not just singling them out, but as a group, a civic organization of women, now incorporating this into many of their uh, health programs throughout the country, that's the level of engagement we've got to do more. But go to these PTAs, go to these block association meetings, on the ground, carrying the information and not assume that people know, and it is obvious because we have a media campaign up here somewhere, we have um, literature, we have uh, resources on the web. Just go to www.cdc.gov. You can find everything you know. People are not going there. I so we've got too, to take it to them. I think, too, um, just to be very clear, each person, each one of us that does know has a responsibility, yes. I feel, to talk about it. Mm -hmm. it my mother used to say, um, something like, you don't have to eat a whole cow to know you're eating beef. You know, if, you, if I know something that I know is true, if I know it's just true, this is my experience. I'm going to talk to my daughter about it. I'm going to talk to my son. I'm going to talk to his frat brothers about it. I'm going to talk to anybody that will listen. Mm -hmm. I'm going to talk to people in my support group. I'm going to talk to my ministry people about it, the people in my church. I'm going to talk to the women I meet that are new mothers with, with, with children and, and don't know what to do. It's my responsibility. So when I say that, you know, it's obvious, it's obvious to enough of us where we should be carrying this message mm -hmm. as, as, as our individual responsibility to do so. And yes, we need to uh, address it on every level and in every possible venue. We definitely need to do that. I think one of the core beliefs, though, is that people don't actually that they will contract the virus. Right. Yeah. It can't happen to me. And the knowledge is not really transpiring into a change in our behavior. I think that we've become addicted in our behaviors. And as a result, we feel hypocritical in trying to teach our youth and others about something else. And I, uh, you know, I, I'm loving the fact that we're finally asking the question, in our, and at the core of our beliefs, do we actually believe when we're having sex that it's possible that I might contract the virus? Mm -hmm. You know, so I, I wanted to follow up on that as well because I think in terms of the issue of whether or not it's obvious to people, um, I, you know, I, I, I agree with what has been, been said that um, People often don't have a basic knowledge about HIV, which I found to be, it's, it's been sort of mind blowing to me. And I think that part of the issue in terms of the HIV community is that within the HIV community, we tend to link to others within the community. And we've often found it difficult to go outside of that community because of uh, people not wanting to hear the message, not being accepting of the message, not wanting to talk about HIV. And so part of, uh, um, of what CDC has done in terms of uh, trying to further the message, as C. Virginia has already uh, referenced, the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation being one of the partners uh, under President Obama's leadership, um, I guess a couple of years ago now, um, the Act Against AIDS uh, Leadership Initiative was actually initiated. But part of that was research that our, our team had done where we actually found that people, particularly black people, just didn't have some of the basics in terms of knowledge around HIV. And um, it was really important to link up with other uh, sorts of civic organizations, to link up with the entertainment community. I mean, we've had some phenomenal things to happen in terms of folks who have just, uh, in the entertainment field, who have stood up. And they want to be a part of this because they want to be able to reach out to uh, uh, young people and other folks that they have um, access to. But I think that not only do people question whether or not it can actually happen to them, I think for a lot of young people, they just believe that if it does happen, it's just 
no big deal because it's just one more thing that they're having to deal with, particularly when you're talking about young people, say, like in a southeastern D.C., where, um, you know, HIV is just one thing. You know, do I have a roof over my head? Do I have food to eat? Do I have to worry about, you know, walking around the corner and being shot by somebody? I mean, there's so many other things that our communities have to contend with. So I agree we have to deal with HIV, not just in terms of looking at HIV, but as Bambi talked about, I mean, issues around STIs, issues around education, issues around economics. It is so complex, and I think that we have done a disservice as a country in terms of HIV by just looking at HIV as though it's some singular kind of thing. But sexuality has always been around. Absolutely. And I mean, HIV Absolutely. is just an outcome of a broader conversation around the fact that we just don't talk about sex, period. Yeah. We don't define it in a healthy way. Um, but, you know, I, I, I've had to force myself to kind of move away from my emotionalism, despite how I may appear, because... I'm dealing with legislators. Mm -hmm. In my state, there is no AIDS prevention funding, period. The one program, Project Faith, which is in jeopardy now, was totally not funded. We are going back in January to try to renegotiate that funding because of the impact it's been having. There, is, there was no funding for the AIDS drug assistance program, zip, yeah. nothing. So when you talk about leverage, we, we're trying to leverage even a match to meet the federal contribution because our state has no investment whatsoever. If you talk to uh, the members of the Black Caucus and those that have an advocacy for HIV, um, they will tell you clearly that there are legislators whose basic premise is let them die. We have said it. That's just one more less yada yada we got to deal with. They should know better. It's, their, it's not my problem. It's not my child, it's not my son, it's not my daughter. And so when you're, when you're talking about ch young people where the rates, I know in my office of young black males that are testing positive, we have ranged from 8%, from anywhere from 3%, all the way up to 12% detection rate. That is, it's, it's beyond unacceptable. It sh we should be in a state of terror that our young black men are getting infected at the rate that we're diagnosing. So again, we're looking at young men, young, predominantly young black men who will live with HIV. This is an economic issue for those of us that are looking for other leverage. This is an economic issue. We come in late to care. We come in with AIDS. Mm -hmm. We don't come in with HIV disease. We come in with a, a clinical diagnosis of AIDS. I know the doctor That's can right. speak to that, which means it costs more money to treat. It means that if we're uninsured, we're on Medicaid, we're going to already get substandard. They, they don't, they don't want to pay for Medicaid. Our state ha hates health care reform. They have no intentions of trying to align themselves with anything that relates to President Obama's health care reform act. And so I say in closure that if we're talking about all these young people who have all these other things going on with mm -hmm. them, we should not only be angry, but we have got to get in the face of these folks in numbers. We had 75,000 people show up because they took the flag to get the flag off the dome so they could put it in the front yard. But when we had the ADAP rally, we only had like 400 people. That's not the white man's fault. That's our fault. We've got to get with it. Yeah. Actually, I'll take liberty. Go. Um, right. Uh, one of the questions I have, really, and I keep asking this question of the CDC, I mean, H1N1. Oh, that was a crisis. I mean, I got H1N1, and I'm fine, right? And I'm like, we're talking about how um, HIV AIDS is at an epidemic, you know, proportions and crisis. I'm like, what does it take for the CDC to respond in the same way with information that we're all saying that nobody has, commercials, things in the bathroom that are telling these are the things you could do, get information, whatever you need, how to put a condom on. You know, we have all, you know, all these other 
uh, things, we're talking about HIV, a uh, highly preventable disease. When mm -hmm. is the CDC, or what do we have to do to get to that? I mean, H1N1 status. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So first of all, Lisa, w what I'm going to say is that we first have to broaden the conversation beyond CDC. Because I think that that's where a lot of people get stuck. This nation, domestically, uh, about $19.5 billion is spent on HIV and AIDS in this country. $19.5 billion. Out of that $19.5 billion, we get CDC, from a, pre a prevention perspective, get less than 4% of that. So this country does not have an appreciation, first of all, for what it means to prevent. And I don't believe that we're going to be able to treat ourselves out of HIV, Thank but you. that's where the concentration is always yeah, focused I on. It's on treatment. That. So first of all, how CDC is going to get to H1N1 in, in terms of status around HIV, we've got to have the sort of, uh, of support and resources from the nation that is directed towards prevention so that prevention can be better incorporated in terms of what we're doing, in terms of our work. That's the first thing. Mm -hmm. CDC can't go to Congress and lobby for dollars. But as I said earlier, if you go and talk to your stakeholders, your congressionals, if you're talking to the people who hold the purse strings, your voice is what makes the difference. Your voice is what counts. Your voice is what counts. In terms of HIV at CDC, uh, I, I am pleased that our new um, agency director has identified what he considers to be six winnable battles. Um, and HIV is one. So HIV is high um, on his list of priorities. Um, we have received some additional dollars in terms of uh, testing for HIV. But again, the prevention point, that is what really concerns me because this is a preventable disease. You're absolutely right. But we need to be able to have the resources to be able to, 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 to make a difference in terms of that. And so if, 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 if you remember nothing else, what I keep telling people is that we've got to broaden this from CDC. I think people tend to talk about CDC because CDC has a kind of brand that people just know. But $19.5 billion, nineteen and a half, and we're getting like a little bit over $600 million of that for our domestic programs. The resources are not enough. The and resources think, are not enough. Just to comment on that also, I think we need to broaden it in terms of the economic impact yes. too. Uh, I mean, when businesses began to see how much it costs in terms of medical care for someone on their payroll, if that person is on that payroll, in terms of, you know, taking care of them, mm -hmm. or how much this country can save in terms of dollars by making sure that we are doing more on the prevention side mm -hmm. before we have to get to the treatment side. And making that argument, because good, bad, right, or wrong in this country, the almighty dollar still speaks in lots of different ways. The other thing I think where we have to broaden it, and this came up yesterday at a session we had when we were talking about education. Hmm. Young woman in the audience, and she may be here today, raised the question, she said, I read this strategy over and over again, I've done an analysis of it. Why isn't the Office of the Department of Education one of the key uh, leading agencies with respect to responding? How are we going to get comprehensive sex education or uh, reproductive health curriculums in schools without involvement of the Department of Education? Mm -hmm. And as uh, Dr. Uh, as Bandy said, the number of the increased cases of sexually transmitted diseases among young people. If they're not getting the information at home, get it in the schools if we're not providing it. Well, the they answer said they, coming they from took CDC, a secondary position. Right, a secondary position. They didn't want position. to be listed. It was too political yeah, to be whatever. listed as a primary. Now, that is outrageous. And that goes back to what, again, uh, Janet said, our voices. We need to be heard on these issues. How can we use the information that Bambi gave us about what is happening in her state, go to that strategy, which is where the focus now of this administration, and I do support that, the information she gave us to make sure that in those three areas, those focus goals, 
that we are addressing. No, they don't want to address it because in states like mine, comprehensive school health uh, law says that I am not permitted as a teacher to discuss homosexuality as a uh, way of being. That the only sexual orientation, they don't even use that word, the only orientation that I can discuss in front of a class is heterosexual relationships in the context of marriage. Mm -hmm. So that means that the Department of Education becomes engaged in this conversation then they have to, if it's a guideline conversation, they would have to propose some formal guidelines on what content should be included to ensure right. that we can reduce the likelihood of infection. The and they don't want to get into that. That we push within the framework of this strategy. Because well. if we don't push those buttons and leave it outside, we're never going to be able to address it in the way that it's going to save lives. And I think yeah, too, in I, terms of... Yeah, I, I would just like to I'll try to be brief. I'm Dr. Rana. Um, I'm a professor at Harvard University. And I've been taking care of children with HIV for the last 25 years. Uh, some of the kids we started taking care of when they were little babies, they are grown up. And something which is so distinctly missing from conversation, even within the group, uh, is, is an issue uh, which is missing from the national conversation and all prevention program. And that is that all our children who have grown up with HIV, they are no different than anybody else and they want to be treated no different than anybody else. But they cannot disclose their diagnosis because it's like they would rather bury themselves than tell somebody because they would lose relations. Dr. Mm -hmm. Rana, how can I tell? How can I take my medication in front of them? I would lose the only love I've had in my lifetime. Mm -hmm. So I think just look at the different illnesses. You know, I, I remember once national cameras were focused for three days on this child who fell through a crack in the ground. Okay. Right. For three days. Today, if a person is diagnosed with HIV, they want to dig a hole that deep and bury themselves. They cannot disclose. You go over and over. People in long-term relationships, they cannot, I mean, they want to disclose, but the fear of losing relationship, fear of being stigmatized, fear of being outcasted is so big, so big, that they cannot begin the conversation. So I can say, very clearly, many of my children who I started taking care of, some of them, they were still fetus. We were doing trials for prevention of perinatal transmission. They're 22, 25. They cannot even tell their long-term sexual partners that they have HIV. They want to practice safe sex, but they cannot always stop well, it. They'll go to jail so stigma must get into conversation. And I just want to make an announcement. On December 1st, World's Aid Day, at Harvard University Blackburn Center, Thanks to Lisa and many other in the audience, we're having an international conference on HIV stigma, the attitude that spreads HIV. That, that is the key, that is what is missing, and we must begin the conversation about stigma. Yeah. I wanted to just follow up on that, if I, if I may, because what was coming up for me as I was listening to the, the previous conversation is the whole issue about stigma. And I absolutely agree with you. St stigma still is rampant in this country as it relates to HIV. And uh, uh, it's, it's, it's still uh, very rampant in our community, in the black community. So when you use the analogy of H1N1, you know, at least I think the other thing that I would say is that H1N1 is something that all America could identify with, you know. Uh, it could be talked about, it could be discussed. But when you talk about HIV, we are still talking about some of the most disenfranchised populations in this country. So when we talk about HIV, we can't forget about homophobia, we can't forget about racism, we can't forget about sexism, because all of those isms impact our ability to be able to do our work in terms of uh, HIV. As the secretary was speaking at USCA, uh, you know, earlier this week, you know, she can say, as a, a white heterosexual woman, if it was a white heterosexual woman, we would all be outraged. America would be outraged. 
But black America needs to be outraged as well. Absolutely. CDC has estimated that one in 16 black men will be diagnosed with HIV within their lifetime, and one in 30 black women will be diagnosed. So if we just begin to count around this room, we need to be outraged. Mm -hmm. Our voices have to be heard, and we have to tell our story. And you can't depend on a CDC or another agency. We've got to depend upon ourselves. Go ahead. <laughs> Wait for the mic. Yeah. One of the things we have to do is we have to talk to each other like grown folk. We have to have an honest conversation. Because the reality of it is none of us in this room going to talk back black pathology with white people in the room. I know that's all. I ain't prejudiced, so don't y'all get nervous. <laughs> but that's just real. I'm not going to talk black black pathology with white people in the room. When we started our civil rights movement, we came together as a people. Amen. We got to close the door and have honest conversation with each other Amen. and agree to disagree. And I think it's wrong. It's not that we ain't outraged. It's just that they pick and choose who the hell going to go to the White House and carry the message. If we just gonna be honest about it, most of us that we're really want to do something for our people, we're you not, ain't getting no. We are not out. You ain't getting no action. We are you, not out. Well, maybe some people you don't know. I know a lot of folks that's really, really PO'd about it, but we don't get a lot of action that we deserve and that we that we need when we come to talk about it. And the other difficult part is, it makes it tough to deal with, especially when you talk about men, because the difficult part is to be able to dis agree to disagree. I'm heterosexual. I ain't gonna never understand in a million years why two men or two women want to be together. But that ain't my issue. My issue is black people. As long as black people are dying, I'm on the front line. I'm, I'm with you till the wheels fall off. But you can't say that. Black leadership can't really say that. And we wonder why don't they get involved. Well, they want to do, I've had sidebar conversations with a lot of brothers. That they want to do this, they want to do that. But then it comes down to the next thing I know, this Negro want me to marry him. Well, I ain't feeling that, Tony. I can't do that. And those are honest conversations. And then if you don't do the one thing, then all of a sudden I'm homophobic. I'm a homophobic because I disagree. I disagree with being a dope fan. You know what I mean? But I ain't throwing the brother away. Those are conversations that we have to have with each other. And I, and I agree with, uh, I don't think it's that we don't know as much. We don't give a damn. Mm -hmm. Well, you got all this other stuff stacked up against you. I mean, HIV, you take a pill, it's, hey, I'm trying to eat. And, and again, we have not engaged. I've tried well, for three years to, to get a conversation with problem. me and talking. With brothers, straight heterosexual brothers. Because my argument, and I could be wrong, but my argument, you ain't going to move the needle until you get us involved. Until you let us come together, talk ignorant, because you're going to get something that's going to talk ignorant, call people faggots and all kind of insane things. But if we can move a brother from here to at least the middle, to where he can see that these black people, we ain't talking about what people doing. Hey, me and my wife doing some things. You know, ain't none of your business. And no more than it's my business what you do. You know, though, but those are grown folk conversations. Mm -hmm. We don't want to have grown folk conversations. And we, and we cannot, most of us that could speak up, can't because people scared of getting their money taken from them. My house knows reasonable, so I can do this. You know, but a lot of people, let's just be real. A lot of people, you got you to buck and do what you got to do and pretend that it's just, this sister flew all these women in, into D.C. Well, it was here, it was here, right? Yes. Flew all these sisters into D.C. Spent all day long, two days, talking women's issues, submitted the stuff. I would venture to say it went in the trash. If we just gonna be honest, if we if we gonna have honest conversations here, if we ain't gonna have honest conversations, we can go somewhere do something else. But how did you feel about that, Virginia? You worked your self off. <laughs> <laughs> and again, we ain't speaking up, and we're afraid of offending somebody. It ain't about, it. and it ain't personal, black and people. And the silence is killing us. It, is, it ain't personal, and you're scared if you say something, somebody gonna call you racist. Somebody well, gonna if call I you if I may if I may just say this. I think that one, one of the problems with this is it's not so much that we are not enraged. There, All of you in here are here for a reason. You came here to get the information, to perpetuate the information, take it back to your communities. What the problem is is having listened to this young lady talk about what's going on in her state. The same thing is happening actually in almost every state at some form. Mm -hmm. The question that I give to ask you is, we can't always get the right response at the grassroots level. Now, now we talk about, yes, we all need to get out there and vote. We need to make sure that the right politician is in place. So why is it that our politicians, the people who are her, having the purse strings, why are they not understanding that they are the ones who are perpetuating social stigma of HIV? if they don't send the money down to do prevention. We've said this over and over and over again. There are some of us, 
listen, I came here with a set form of papers that I was going to read to you my little speech <laughs> because I have been the angry black woman doctor in the room for the last 20 years. I vowed today not to be that. <laughs> I'm going to let the rest of you. But we have, to, we, have to, we have to put the question to the people who can really affect the change. If our president has a bill on the, why, why is everybody not dealing with that, making it so that everybody gets health care? What is the issue here? I don't personally understand it. The folks that slink into my office every Saturday, because that's when I have clinic, a quiet clinic, for those who don't want to come in when everybody else is there, this has been going on for years. We know that. We are all, we are angry, but we need to get to the people who have the money to make the changes to make this go away, and it's not happening. The Department of Education doesn't want to be involved. The Department of Minority Affairs may not want to be involved because county it may be. Don't want county to be council don't Council may be. These are the folks we have to get to. And we have to find a way to do that. Okay, they you got you, you got hope, hope. Wait, 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 wait. Time out for one minute. Okay. <laughs> we got a big family in here, so everybody has to get a chance to talk, and we need to know who you are. So we have time for uh, uh, one more question, and then we, we need to we'll switch the panel. We're going to continue the conversation. We're just going to have the people in the front. Okay, so stuff. is there, so you're going <laughs> to have hand. your, your turn. <laughs> Wakefield has had his let hand let, up back here. Let's let you talk when you get on the stage yeah. and, okay. and let the uh, young lady behind. And Wakefield, please be our last. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Um, I'm a certified HIV tester in, in the community, former domestic violence counselor. On a smaller level, on a much smaller intimate level, uh, my biggest issue is that parents forget to love their children. They go out of home every day, the parents do not hug their children, okay? They need to be touched. These children are not promiscuous. They are simply looking for affection and love. And we forget that on such a small, simple level that it has imploded into this huge, chaotic, demographic and it's such it's such a small little thing to touch a child to touch somebody to love somebody to tell you that tell them that you love them and we forget I'm giving out 110 hugs every day because their parents have sent them out without a touch and then we wonder why our kids are molested we wonder why they're choosing the wrong partners because mommy and daddy didn't even bother to hug you in the morning before you left we can do something on such a small, small, small level to start there and to start having conversations there. But we don't even kiss and hug our children anymore. And then we wonder why they're going out and, and engaging in risky behavior. They're not engaging in risky behavior. They're just trying to be loved. And we've forgotten that on, it's such a huge thing. We cannot underestimate the value of touch this is how they got there in the first place because we forgot to touch them as a people. So please go out and hug your children. Wait. Hmm. There's some co factors here that are cultural. I don't know if I can talk about it or not. But Hold on a minute. We, we're going to keep this conversation going. I, I haven't forgotten you. <laughs> go ahead, Wakefield. I'm Wakefield. I'm with the HIV Vaccine Trials Network. My comment doesn't come from them. It comes in appreciation of what I've heard this morning, and particularly the conversations around our making some economic changes. I really think that if I want to buy a house for $100,000, I make my first offer at $150,000. So if we want some things to be different, we're at, we need to begin to think about what the CBC can do. What are some legislative changes that could be made? You know, right now, their commitments for the next 10 years to, to colleges like, at, to universities like Harvard, Harvard. Could there be a policy statement made that those people will only continue to get the money that's committed to them if they're doing their work and their research in the southeast part of the U.S. in partnership with community-based organizations? Mm -hmm. Are there some restrictions that we can put in there? You know, the CDC is, has encouraged us to work on HIV testing. You know, could we, could we, have from Congress some sort of incentives to companies that are going to work on home test kits so that people could test their partner right there in the home 
so we can build the technology and move it forward. If we can do a 20 minute test, I should be able to do that 20 minute test with my partner in the home. You know, we've got to begin, I just want to encourage us to start to think out of the box and think of things that the Congressional Black Caucus might introduce. And we may be introducing them at the $150,000 level to get the $100,000 home. But I think we've got to start thinking differently, and I appreciate the panel. Yeah. Thank you. And could I make a quick acknowledgement in terms of the CBC? Because we talked a lot about elected officials, and I would be totally remiss if I did not acknowledge uh, the leadership and support that has been demonstrated by Congresswoman uh, Waters, uh, Barbara Lee, and uh, Donna Christian Christensen. They continue to keep vigil in terms of Thank HIV you. among black folks. So, yeah. Last um, I just wanted to comment on the, what the doctor said in terms of elected officials. I couldn't agree with her more, and we don't do that enough. We talk among ourselves. Every meeting I go to, whether it's national, state, or local, is essentially the same people in the room. We're attempting to broaden mm -hmm. that group, but we need to have these conversations at the local, the state, and the federal level. We cannot assume that they know because they don't, and they have said this to us. So we need to have those conversations around policy issues, Wakefield, around the budget issues, and around the strategy. I keep bringing it back because, again, this is the box in which we are now all in, whether we want to be in it or not. This is the leading way to address all of these issues we are talking about here today. If we don't read it, understand it, and try to fit into it our issues, including how we address HIV or the heterosexual black male community, because black women are getting this disease through sexual intercourse with black men. So that's where we need to go and be a part of the discussion and not say it's for them and it's not for us. We've got to be.